Uh, hi, thank you everyone for attending today's talk where I'll be presenting our work on accelerating birth on the tensor steering processor. Let me start by acknowledging how impactful birth has been. Ever since its inception by Google in 2017, it has taken the machine learning world by storm. It became the industry standard for natural language processing applications in BERT, GPT, and their derivatives are really achieving state-of-the-art performance on various NLP tasks. In fact, transforms have been performing so well in NLP domain that researchers have explored using them in other domains like vision and speech recognition. All in all, this really highlights how important of a workload transformers have become. In this work, we focus on BERT, which is a transformer-based model that is widely adopted in the industry. I'm fairly confident that most of us deal with a service that has BERT in the back end on a daily basis. Right? Uh, Google and Microsoft uses it in their web search, Twitter uses it in its content moderation, Roblox uses it in its text classification, and there are many other examples. Interestingly, in these examples and several others, BERT is deployed in these real-time services that interact with users and thus come with a very tight latency constraint. This latency constraint is not just on BERT, but it's rather on the end-to-end -end service. And this effectively adds even more constraint on BERT, which is just a single component of this of the service. And this really tight constraint motivated us uh, to start this work, which has the goal of achieving consistently low inference through BERT. And to focus on this consistent low latency, we are targeting a batch one inference, and we're even focusing on the tail latency of this batch one inference. Now, before talking about how do we accelerate BERT on the TSP, I'll give a bit of a background, and then finally, we'll talk more about the results. Okay, let's start the background by talking about BERT. Uh, we'll be looking at it from a compute perspective. So trying to figure out what equations do we need to compute to get an inference working through BERT. At a high level, you can view BERT as divided into these three blocks, an embedding block, an encoder block, and then a task-specific output block. Most of the compute is really within that encoder block. So let's look at, at it under the hood. It's As you can see, it's comprised of these several layers stacked on top of each other. Looking Deeper into one layer, we can see the following. So the layer will accept an input tensor X. Using that input tensor X, it will produce three tensors, a query tensor, a key tensor, and a value tensor, Q, K, and V. I won't go into uh, detail about the intuition behind that. Uh, I'll just focus on the equation. We get these Q, K, and V by effectively multiplying X by a weight tensor and then adding a bias, really a gem operation. Then we multiply Q and K perform a softmax operation, get the result multiplied by V, which gives us the output of this block or the single head output. In an encoder layer, we have several heads. So we're doing that same operation multiple times. So the same X would feed another head block and another head block to give us this multi-head attention block. It's the exact same computation, just using different weights and biases. And the output would be a set of head tensors. We would then concatenate these heads all together, run a gem again, uh, then normalize the output using a layer norm operation, take that output, run it through a gem, then an activation function, genu in this case, then run that through a, another gem operation, then perform a layer normalization to finally get the output of the layer. And this output of the layer feeds into the input of the next layer, and that's how you build up the stack of layers. Awesome. We've now covered very briefly, I might add, uh, the compute and BERT. And let's talk about the Grok tensor streaming processor architecture, the chip that we're targeting. Uh, for the sake of time, again, I will be very brief in this overview. I would refer the audience to the Grok ISCA 2019 paper if you want to understand more about the DSP. So the TSP at its heart, it's a domain-specific architecture that accelerates general machine learning workloads. It's a single core 
built from different heterogeneous functional units. And as you can see from this picture here, uh, these functional units are spread across the chip. And that chip is almost symmetric across the meridian where we have a Western and East hemisphere. The TCP also has three registers that are responsible for moving data between functional units. A functional unit would read from or write to stream registers that are next to it. And that data on the stream registers would always be flown. You can think about the stream registers as if they're a conveyor belt where data is always moving. A functional unit can pick something up, operate on it, and then write it, put it back down in the conveyor belt. One key piece of information here also is that these functional units operate on vectors of data. More specifically, a vector of 320 bytes. That's our basic operating unit for these functional units. Now let's look at uh, the first function unit, which is memory. The DSP has 88 independent SRAM slices that can be accessed concurrently, which gives us a huge amount of on-chip uh, bandwidth. These memory slices are divided 44 slices on the east, 44 slices on the west, and they're com they're, they include Every slice has 8,192 addresses of 320 byte words. The second module in DSP is the switch execution module. This is the SXM, and that module is, is responsible for data manipulation. Uh, so interdata movements like shifting, permutation, transpositions will happen in this SXM. We have two of these guys, one in the east, one in the west. Next, we move to the VXM. And that is the vector execution module. It's, com it, it's composed of 16 ALUs. Each ALU operates on 320 byte vectors. These are the operands that the ALU accepts. And it performs pointwise arithmetic, stuff like add, subtract, or even exponentiation, reciprocal square root, things like that. It can all be performed within an ALU. One key feature that we heavily leveraged in our implementation is that these ALUs can be chained together uh, to form a more complex function without the need to go out of the VXM to memory or anywhere else. Last but by no means least is the matrix execution module or the MXM. And that's really the power horse of the TSP. That's where we do matrix multiplication. It natively supports int8 and fp16 operands and we have two modules, one in the east, one in the west. Each module has two planes, and each plane has a 320 by 320 multiply accumulate array. When we're doing an int8 multiplication, uh, we basically load a weight tensor into this plane and then start streaming activation vectors uh, into that. So the plane would consume one activation vector every cycle, and after some latency, it would start producing an output vector every cycle. And this output is now in 32. Awesome. So we've covered now the application we want to accelerate, which is BERT. We've covered uh, the chip we're targeting. Now, the last missing link is how are we programming that chip, which brings me to the Grok API slide. Grok API is this low-level programming framework that allows users to have full control over the execution of their program on the TSP. It has a Python front end and users can orchestrate decisions like resource allocation, scheduling, and every other decision on how the program will be executed. Here I'm showing a trivial snippet of a Grok API uh, program. The reason why I'm showing it is I wanted to uh, give you an insight on the level of abstraction uh, we were programming the TSP with. So here we've defined three input tensors, A, B, and C. And then in the last line here, we're performing the equation A plus B minus C. We first uh, add A and B together and specify which ALU we want. We specify that we want ALU zero in the VXM, and then we get the output and chain it directly to ALU one to perform a subtraction. And then at that point, we say we want to get the output and write it to memory. We even specify at what time do we want to schedule that subtraction operation. This really uh, highlights the level of control we have with the Block API. Okay, now that we've covered our background, let's look at how do we accelerate BERT on the TSP. So we're working with an int8 quantized BERT, 
That means our matrix multiplications, uh, namely the general operations, are performed with int8 operands. The output is n32. Our nonlinear operations, uh, such as GLU, softmax, layer norm, uh, are all work with fp32 operands. This means we have to do quantization and dequantization whenever we're crossing the gem part to the nonlinear part. So, for example, in the first equation here, we're performing a gem operation, multiplying a by w and then adding a bias to get an n32 output. We have to dequantize that to fp32 before feeding it into a GALU operation. And then after getting the output of the GALU operation, fp32, we have to quantize it back again to int8 because the output will feed another gym. Now, one thing that we were set on from the beginning of this work is we knew that to accelerate BERT, uh, we have to pipeline and fuse as many of these nonlinear ops and gyms together so that we increase the utilization of the different function units of the TSP in order to achieve uh, lower latency through an inference. So let's, let's look at how we did that. Start with the GALU. Uh, so this is the GALU operation. And remember, we have to do a dequantization and a quantization uh, before and after it. We map this equation along with the dequant and the quant into 16 ALUs of the VXM. So we built one very long chain of ALUs utilizing all ALUs of the VXM to perform this entire operation. That means in every clock cycle, this chain of ALUs would consume one input vector one physical input vector, dequantize it, perform a GALU, quantize it, and then produce an output vector every clock cycle. And this highly optimized uh, GALU with the dequantization and quantization allowed us to pipeline this entire operation with the upstream gym. So X in this case is generated by a gym, and there's no need with this highly optimized chain, we don't have to wait uh, for the gym to finish producing X we can immediately start working on the very first physical vector of X that's coming out of the gym. So this diagram on the right-hand side here shows the timing schedule of the MXM and the VXM. We start performing gem operation, and as soon as we get the first physical output vector of X, we send that directly to the VXM to start performing the game. This allowed us to hide most of the GALU time behind the gym. In fact, uh, the remaining or the only visible time uh, latency of the GALU is a constant, it's independent of the tensor size, and it's basically just the time for one vector to travel from the LXM to the VXM and go through the 16 ALUs. Next, let's look at the layer norm operation. Each encoder layer has two layer norm operations, and they have this exact same format. We start with an N32X and an FT32Y. We first dequantize that X to FT32, add it to Y to get Z. And then we perform layer norm on Z. Layer norm is calculated by subtracting the average of Z from Z and then dividing by the standard deviation, then multiply by gamma and add to beta, both of which are learnable parameters of the model. When looking at this layer norm equation, we can tell that to perform this operation, we need three passes over the input tensor Z. One pass to calculate the mean, another pass to calculate the variance, and then the final pass to normalize z given the mean and variance we just calculated. So how did we accelerate that part? Looking in the first pass, we overlap the production of z with the calculation of the mean of z. Uh, so we did that by building a chain of four ALUs. When we start with x, we quantize it by casting to an FT32, scaling it, and then we add y to that which would give us Z, but at the same time, every physical vector produced by this ALU would be sent to another ALU to perform an accumulation in preparation for the mean calculation. You will notice here that we're only using four ALUs in this chain, so we've instantiated four of these chains that are working in parallel so that we can produce four physical vectors of Z every clock cycle. At the end of uh, passing through Z, we'd end up with four partial sums of z that we would then reduce to calculate the mean of z. Uh, now, I won't talk much about the second, the optimization we did for the second and the third pass, but they are slightly similar to what I just described. And 
there is there are more details in the paper uh, about these two passes. Okay, now moving on to the last block that we've accelerated, which is the multi-head attention block. Uh, so the multi-head attention block starts with an X. Then we should we, we usually calculate Q, K, and V for every head. A very common optimization is to calculate Q, K, and V for all the heads together. So with a single gem, we can calculate Q for all the heads and similarly K and V for all the heads. However, after that, we'd have to do a bit of data manipulation to extract the heads uh, because we later have to work, we have to perform gems on independent heads. Uh, so this data manipulation is denoted here with these reordered nodes. After we extract the heads, then we perform a batch gem with Q and K for each head. In a softmax, and then again an independent, uh, independent gems for each head, multiplying the output of the softmax with the v. Now, how do we schedule that? We start by uh, computing q and k using all four MXM planes. So we're keeping the MXM busy, generating q and k, and at the same time we're keeping the vxm busy by requantizing that. We need to requantize the output from n32 to n8 because it will be used uh, in a downstream gem. Then we store the output uh, into memory. Then we, we, we create a deep pipeline that uh, fuses the reordering, the batch gem, and the softmax into one very deep pipeline. So we start reading Q from memory, send it to the SXM, perform some data manipulation, send the output of the SXM directly to the MXM to perform the matrix multiplication, get the output from the matrix multiplication, directly send it to the VXM to perform the softmax. So we have this very deep pipeline where we don't, we don't have to go to memory in this entire uh, loop of movement. What this gives us is it allowed us to completely hide the latency of the softmax behind the gems. And we're, e we're even able to hide most of the data manipulation delay behind the gems as well. And this deep pipelining was really key in accelerating this entire block. Okay, now uh, let's look at results. I'll start by uh, giving a bit of context. Uh, we uh, we started with a pre-trained uh, based model. We performed quantization-aware training, fine-tuning of the model with the Squad 1.1 training dataset to target a question and answering task. Our quantized model achieves an F1 score of 87.16 versus 87.18 for the FP32 unquantized model. In our experiment, we ran inferences on the TSP with the 900 megahertz clock, and we'll compare results against the NVIDIA published highly optimized tensor RT implementation running on the A100 GPU. And we basically built that point because this was the current state of the art. Uh, it's the current lowest latency of an inference to work. Before comparing the results, let's look at the, the TSP results and more specifically the latency distribution. So to get that, we've uh, ran 4,000 batch one inferences on uh, the TSP for birth days with a sequence length of 128. And we noted the latency of every single inference and here we're plotting that uh, distribution. The first key takeaway here is that av our average latency is 129 microseconds, which is really, really Fast. The second takeaway, the second takeaway is this very tight distribution of latency. If we uh, dig a bit deeper and compare the latency of the first percentile, which represents one of the faster inferences, to the 99th percentile, which represents one of the slower inferences, we see that the difference is only one microsecond, and it's coming from the host to TSP communication. And let's let's look at our comparison to the current state of the art. So here I'm plotting the average, the 95th and the 99th percentile latency for the A100 and the TSP. Looking at the A100 results first, we'll see that the latency increased by 25% when we move from the average to the 99th percentile. And this is not unexpected. GPUs have active components like caches that could result in different execution time based on the input and based on the context of the entire program. Interestingly, 
our latency across the TS our TSP latency is almost the same from average to the 99th percentile. At the average latency, we achieve a 5x speed up compared to the A100. And because of this consistently low latency, if we go all the way out to the tail at the 99th percentile, the speed up goes up to 6x. Okay, let's, uh, let's summarize. So today we talked about how important BERT is that it's widely adopted in many real-time systems in the industry, and so that enforces a very strict latency constraint on an inference through BERT. We've shown that by deeply pipelining operations in BERT, we're able to increase the utilization of the functional units of the PSP, which allowed us to accelerate BERT inference to achieve a 99th percentile latency of 130 microseconds, which is six times lower than the current state of the art latency. Thank you for attending today's talk and I'm happy to take questions.